Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, as we come towards the end of the year, it becomes a season, the holiday season, and that means that all the big AAA games are starting to get the release in anticipation for Christmas, including Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, a game series which I've previously not had any interest in, but this time they went all spaceship. And given that they have sci-fi settings on all the planets in the solar system, I thought it would be fun to actually do a science video and talk about some of the stuff that's in the game. Talk about some of the sci-fi tropes that they've borrowed from and generally put the science back into the science fiction for fun and entertainment. Now I'm going to point out this isn't going to be a review of the game. I don't own the game. I haven't got a review copy of the game. I haven't played the game because I am bad at first person shooters. But it does present a lot of fun things to talk about. And, you know, I do understand that there are at least two other big, high-profile, AAA, first-person shooters this year, which are probably equally worth your time, but I'm not going to talk about those, we're just going to talk about the science in this. So let me be clear, there will be spoilers. So let's start by talking about the various places you can go in the game. There is uh, sequences where you can pick the destination, whereas there are other story missions that absolutely will take place at certain time and certain locations. The game starts out on Europa during an airdrop, and of course it looks fantastic with Jupiter hanging in the sky and the clouds and the winds, and yeah, Europa doesn't have any of that. I mean, in astronomical terms, it does have an atmosphere, but it's so tenuous, it's literally a trillion times less dense than the atmosphere on Earth. But in Infinite Warfare, we see them f jumping through clouds, we see, well, we see winds blowing on the surface. It's more like a visit to the Arctic than it is to Jupiter's moon. Also, because of Europa's proximity to Jupiter, it is bathed in a lot of radiation from Jupiter's magnetosphere. And I would expect the crew to be incredibly worried about the fact that if they uh, stayed around for more than about an hour, they would get a lethal dose of radiation. A later key mission takes place on Titan, and that does have an actual thick atmosphere. Now, the Titan mission that is a fuel refinery, and that's a really cool idea because, of course, Titan, it has a thick nitrogen atmosphere, but it also has a lot of hydrocarbons that are being formed naturally due to the interaction of the atmosphere and the sun. Now, I'm not sure what kind of sci-fi technology would use these primitive hydrocarbon fuels, but it's a really cool setting. Also, one of the characters comments about how he grew up there as a kid and would take boat rides with his father, which is cool because there are actually lakes of uh, various hydrocarbons on the surface of Titan. We've sent a spacecraft down to the surface of Titan. And that's where things start to go wrong because, hey, the surface of Titan as rendered in the game is crazy, craggy surfaces with all sorts of rock constructs. The, the surface that we photoed was more like a riverbed, much more sedate, much more simple. But moving elsewhere in the solar system, Venus. Venus also has a thick atmosphere, well, not the thickest atmosphere of any of the terrestrial planets. But uh, there's a mission there, an optional mission where you chase a large spacecraft through the clouds and get to, you know, of course, blow it up. But uh, what really caught my attention was the blurb text in the map that tells you that Venus is a source of deuterium. Now, in, it's, this is kind of an interesting observation because over Venus they looked at the hydrogen to deuterium ratio and the deuterium levels are about a hundred times higher and the mechanism that causes this is Venus has you know, the worst greenhouse effect ever. It is hellishly hot at the surface and what's happened is the water boils off into the upper atmosphere and in the upper atmosphere Sometimes it gets disassociated by the uh, the sun, and the hydrogen, being very light, gets blown off into space. But because the deuterium weighs twice as much, it tends to stay around longer. So over the lifetime of Venus, the deuterium levels in the upper atmosphere are a hundred times higher. So while I'm not going to comment on the feasibility of the logistics of mining deuterium for Venus, I thought this was a really cool observation by whoever laid, uh, whoever wrote that up. The grand finale of the game takes us to Mars, and this is a very different kind of Mars. It's noted in the flavor text again that Mars has had some terraforming, but apparently the atmosphere is still very heavy in carbon dioxide. I noticed that during this sequence several of the characters are literally just wearing a breathing mask, they're not wearing a proper spacesuit. Because, you know, right now you would need a proper spacesuit. The atmosphere on Mars is 1% of that of Earth. It is essentially the same as vacuum as far as the human body is concerned. But if you could make the atmosphere on Mars 30 times thicker, 
then you could certainly get away with just a breathing mask supplying pure oxygen. And the ultimate finale moment takes place on a Martian space elevator. And this actually looks really wrong to me. And I mean, it's a cool idea, definitely. It's a great concept to have a shipyard which is attached by a tower to the planet, and then it would have the tower extend further out. It would have to go up uh, 11,000 miles to match the what the equivalent of geostationary orbit is over Mars. And the one in the game looks way too short because, let's face it, you know, you need to have the game move fast and if you would take several days to travel 11,000 kilometers, it wouldn't be quite as exciting. And while we're on the subject of travel times, let me just point out I love the fast travel sequences in this game where everyone gathers around the console and they, they put in their keys and of course the Lieutenant Gator flies the spacecraft. I'm going to point out that's almost certainly a shout out to Battlestar Galactica where uh, Lieutenant Gata was the dude that was flying the Galactica through its uh, hyperspace jumps. I mean obviously this is made up future technology and I, I mean you could certainly ask questions about how you could really have a war with fronts when it's possible for spacecraft to jump such long distances so fast and with such great accuracy but of course the game just needs that level of uh, ability you know the speed to go from one mission to the next to keep the game exciting but having futuristic made up technology does not get you out of having to follow the laws of physics in several occasions you basically fly your spacecraft to orbit to end the mission the way they fly up is they basically go straight upwards. Well, they go up at a 45 degree angle, but they certainly don't make any attempt to fly up and get into orbit. You're just magically there. The game doesn't really care about orbital mechanics in this case. Having said that, I was happy to see that the spacecraft fighting sequences where you're flying around in your space fighter, they are much more happy to follow the six degree of freedom uh, type of flight model that you would see in a real space fighter. Although for some bizarre reason this capability is lost when you go back to actually land on the carriers where uh, you basically have to fly in in a carrier approach and if you miss it they make you fly around and go around again. And to slow down instead of arrestor wires they have a little drone that comes out and grabs your spacecraft to slow you down. These drones they will also resupply your missiles and uh, other ammunition in flight during the battle. Which makes me wonder, these drones are capable of very precise maneuvering, very accurately. Why don't we have such capable flight control software on our spacecraft? Why does a human have to do it when clearly this drone is capable of pinpoint maneuvers? Just give it a hydrogen bomb and ask it to dock with the enemy targets and the war will be over in minutes. And of course the reason for this is it's a game and we want to be the ones flying around in our spaceships blowing up stuff because that makes for a good game. But it's of course this gameplay that leads to the modern first person shooter mechanic of you getting shot at, you take damage, the screen goes red and you hide in a corner and you get better. At no point do the bullets come through and puncture your suit or shatter your face mask until it's dramatically appropriate. And this brings us to the game's treatment of the whole depressurization as a weapon. Certainly there's uh, a few moments in the game where you can literally rip face masks off the enemies which is kind of cool looking to be honest, it's pretty exciting, but you yourself never suffer from such problems unless it's dramatically appropriate. And it's during one of these dramatically appropriate moments where they get things really wrong. You, there's a moment where the moon base pressure fails and you find yourself flying out onto the lunar surface, you uh, crack your face mask and you're desperately trying to get back indoors and your entire team is helping you and you come into an airlock, they don't have time to close the outer door so they use brute force to push open the inner door and as soon as the door closes you take off the face mask. Now this is, this is frankly ridiculous because atmospheric pressure is about 10 tons per square meter, 15 pounds per square inch. So if you look at that door, it's a two meter by two meter door, the force on that door is about 40 tons. Now maybe it's lower atmospheric pressure, it could be as low as 15 tons, but even with the mechanized might of Ethan on your team at that moment, I don't think it's realistically that you could move 15, 20 tons of air pressure to get through a door like that. By the way, Ethan is easily my favorite character in this game. Seriously, he gets all the best lines. I do, Lieutenant. I do. I carry the brain of a human farmer. Holy shit, are you serious? No, man. Not at all. <laughs> you got you, Lieutenant. Did not. 
There is also a fantastic set piece in the game where you are attacking an enemy warship and to board the ship you blow up one of the windows on the bridge and of course bridge crew are flying out into the vacuum of space and then you enter in there's people they're held on but they're twitching as they're breathing their last in the vacuum of space including the enemy captain and you get a special dog tag for killing him but as part of this whole thing as soon as you get into the bridge your friends close the screens and the pressure comes back in the time that you they were exposed to space they would have certainly passed out but they would not be dead being exposed to the vacuum of space assuming you l allow yourself to breathe out is not immediately fatal you will pass out in a few seconds but your body will have oxygen in the blood and assuming you can get air pressure back in it is a an eminently survivable experience so perhaps the game was a little swift in offering you a reward for the enemy's death elsewhere in the game there are a couple of optional missions that involve uh, infiltrating enemy spacecraft by basically hiding in asteroid belts and then watching the spacecraft come by and then kind of knocking on the door and getting in in reality those uh, clusters of asteroids don't actually exist. In the real asteroid belt, if you are on an asteroid, the odds are the nearest asteroid is a really, really long way away. You will not get these tight clusters of asteroids that you get in video games. And it's on another larger asteroid where the physics just goes absolutely crazy. There is a fantastic level which is set on Vesta 3. Now, this is presumably not the asteroid Vesta Four. It is a smaller asteroid which somehow is now falling into the sun and rotating about once per minute. Now the reason that it's falling into the sun and spinning so fast was apparently it was attacked by the enemy and the weapons knocked it off its orbit and caused it to spin up. The problem is if you do the math, then you know I love to do the math, then you would realize that you would need to accelerate this asteroid to something like 40 to 50 kilometers per second to get it to begin to fall into the sun. But on top of that, it would take weeks, not hours, not days, to fa start falling as far as it did. And this is by accident. I mean, if you could deliberately take an asteroid and make it move that fast, you would have an incredibly effective weapon with which to strike at the Earth. Of course, you'd have to be careful that you didn't spin it up to a 1 RPM like the Vesta asteroid because in that case, the whole asteroid would probably fly apart due to its own uh, rotational speed. In fact, the gravity on the asteroid is really wonky. The gravity should be practically non-existent at that size, except everyone is seen running around just like they're on the planet Earth. Everywhere in the game, there's either gravity or there's no gravity. There's no lower gravities or higher gravities. They're all the same. And that's especially noticeable on Vesta, where not only is it essentially zero G, but the thing is spinning so fast that in many cases, if you jumped, you would literally fly off into space and get incinerated by the sun. The Vesta 3 level does make for an amazing set piece. I had this idea a long time ago for something like this in a game where you would be hiding in the shadows as the object rotated. Not that I'm accusing them of stealing that idea because it's just an awesome idea and if you think about awesome ideas in space people will come up with that. I do notice the phrase fly safe being used quite a bit but again I didn't coin that. That comes from EVE Online. But while that's probably the worst example of planetary physics in the game, the worst example of physics in general is the, in the game is the whole application of sound in space. There, it's everywhere, and you just can't avoid it. It's not realistic, but whatever. It's a big AAA action first-person shooter game, and everybody wants to have their awesome sound effects. No, I, I watched it through the game, and... I just thought of it as a dumb Michael Bay action movie and obviously that's going to work for some people and not for others. I love the look of the spacecraft and the, the art of the planets. It had real you know, slick design and the physics were about the same quality as your average action movie. I might pick up a copy at some point when it goes on sale just so I can play the single player campaign but I certainly wouldn't have time for multiplayer or anything but look thanks to the people that made it you know uh, you're welcome to space great work if you're making any sequels feel free to ask me for advice but uh, i'll see you in space i'm scott manley fly safe fly safe Captain thank you Captain